And what is up, everybody? Hope you've had a wonderful week. Welcome to Paizo Friday. It's me, your old buddy, Dan. You can find me on Twitter at Dan underscore Servo, which is right underneath my name there. Uh, today, I don't know if you've heard, but we had some shocking revelations <laughs> over the week. We talked about paladins. Paladins, paladins, paladins. Um, and the person that wrote that blog is Mark Seifter, who happens to be sitting right next to me right here. Uh, Mark Seifter is a designer on the uh, Pathfinder playtest team. Works with uh, Steven and Logan and Jason and all of that. So what we thought we would do is uh, recap the blog, take some questions, talk to you about everyone's favorite paladin. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Seifter. Hi, everybody. There he is. Yeah, Dan and I think <laughs> that a paladin... Uh, sort of chat is a real great idea that couldn't possibly go wrong. And I'm sure that you guys are going to join us in a friendly and respectful chat about the Paladin. Okay. I mean, that's what the Paladins would want, right? I, uh, you know, I've got my own questions that maybe don't fit into that profile, but we're going to get into this anyway. Oh, yes. Uh, so, but let's get started by talking <laughs> about the blog. So, uh, and before we get started, let me just uh, welcome everybody. I'm seeing a lot of familiar names in the chat. Thank you for joining us. We've got April in there. Uh, we've got Pooping Owls, of course. Thank you for joining us. Night Race is there. Uh, Todd won out. A lot of people from the Glass Cannon uh, Twitch feed that I recognize. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we're here every Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we all, I also upload these episodes the following week on Wednesday onto our YouTube channel. So feel free to share those and like those and join in. So, Mark. Yeah, let me talk about the blog. The, pa the Paladin. It, it's sort of answering the question from Laurie7x3 about whether it'll be easier to role play in PF2 because that's where I started on the blog. So the thing about Paladins that is probably clear to anyone who's been on the message boards for any amount of time, even before we released the blog, is that they are the most contentious class and the most contentious topic, whether class or not class, in all of Pathfinder. If you go on paizo.com or even just do a way back and look to any particular week, there's probably like, did my paladin fall? Oh my gosh, there was an evil artifact in an orphanage and my paladin burned down the orphanage. <laughs> Was it, did, did they fall? And, or, or all sorts of different questions that, that are always asked on Paizo.com. And some right. of them are like even less trollish than the question I just asked. There are some legitimately problematic situations you can come up with. So for anyone who's read the Pathfinder 1 Paladin Code, if you were swore yourself in in court to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and then the judge blindsides you and asks you a question that is going to reveal where some innocent refugees are hiding that you know the judge is going to have executed. Right. You're screwed in the Pathfinder 1 Paladin Code. Mm -hmm. At best, you could, you could say, like, I really am uncomfortable answering this question because it could harm innocence, and maybe and you could ap appeal to the judge mm -hmm. that to please take back the question. But if they press, then you either have to disrespect your, you're, you're screwed between three different parts of the Paladin Code, because there's the fact that you just swore an oath, uh -huh. the fact that it's a, that assuming that the judge is a legitimate authority, that he's an illegitimate authority, and right. that you need to protect the innocence. So that's an example I used in the blog. Uh -huh. In the playtest, a code is a little bit different. Okay. And the way we, or I guess, I've been one of the primary people who's been tinkering with the code. So the way I tried to fix it was I kept all this, most of the stuff that we remember from the code. I got rid of the don't use poison because it's always been a little bit weird that poison was listed as something that is always dishonorable. Like there are dishonorable right. ways to use poison. If I just slip it in your drink, in your water before the Twitch stream, that's pretty dishonorable. <laughs> water. But, I'm sorry. Oh, it was alcohol. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> okay. But if I am just using enhanced weaponry and like you have a flaming sword and I have a sword that gushes out poison, like what's the difference? Also, there's not a clause on associates that like forces you to walk away from, from certain people. But mostly all of the different tenets that were in the Paladin's Code are in the code. The difference is they have an order of precedence. And the code specifically states that a higher tenet of the code is um, if it comes in conflict with a lower tenet of the code, mm -hmm. then you follow the higher tenet rather than just being screwed. Uh, 
it does have a, a little bit there about like any attempt to game the code to your own advantage automatically violates the code. Like for instance, if you because um, keeping your word is above respecting authorities, if you right. swore oath is like I swear I will never respect any authorities. <laughs> oh look, authorities, I'm not going to respect you because I have to keep my oath. Then stick into the code. You're obviously trying to game the code, or if like you bring an innocent that you put into harm's way so that you can do other things because it stops them from being in harm to right. try to like to lie all the time right. because like right. well if I lied for my own advantage to cheat and like steal all of your money Mr. Merchant um, <laughs> I would probably be able to escape and but that would break the code but since this innocent person is here who would get imprisoned and probably their family would be in trouble that, that I just brought this innocent person here and said he was my confederate now I can yeah you, so you can't do that yeah that's not allowed Yes. Okay, gotcha. So that's basically how how the code works now. And I wrote the whole code out onto the blog for anyone who's interested. It's not just an excerpt. It's, it is literally, I took it, copy-pasted it from the in-copy file of the Paladin. So um, people have been making some threads of like looking at it, seeing if they can break it and make a no-win situation. and. So far, so good, but maybe you guys will find something else and we will we'll make it even better. But of course, the code itself is not what is always the most contentious question about paladins because the most contentious question about paladins is about what sorts of paladins there are. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit about a little bit about that this week. A little. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I started the blog actually by with a section on called the Quest for the Holy Grail, which was all about how I wandered around Paizo and talked to all of the the creative staff at Paizo and asked like what so what do you think about paladins? And one person might be like, Well, the lawful good paladins need to be in the game. Chaotic evil anti paladins have been there for a really long time, so put those in. Those are the only ones I care about or even don't put anything else in. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone else might say, said, someone else said lawful good paladins and lawful evil anti-paladins are more of a priority because they're like the tyrant in Ultimate Intrigue and uh, chaotic evil, I guess. And they were just, they were all pretty different. Okay. So then what, so based off of that, and these are people that are working on the game day in, day out. This is, that's their job. What do you take away from an answer like that from our own offices? So, my conclusion from our own offices is that there was no, there was no real distinct thread among the things that people wanted, except for that there was no one who said not to have a lawful good paladin. <laughs> no one who was like, well, I don't really see them as fitting lawful good for any reason, but they, if the chaotic, neutral, chaotic evil, and neutral evil, those three are all the ones. That right. We, so... That was the only thing that was that was definitely shared, and I would say that the opinions were very varied. Although you could sort of try to put them into camps of minimalism of things we've already done before in first edition versus more, mm -hmm. uh, but that's just an arbitrary distinction for an opinion that was really on a spectrum and has a lot of different different points and ideas. Okay. So so then when you say you went around and talked to everybody around the office, uh, particularly right. the creative staff uh, and all of that stuff, what what exactly did you say? Were, were you just asking about alignment? Were you asking about anything else? Or was it just, when it comes to paladins, what alignments do you think we should be doing? Or was there more to that, that question? Uh, so I tried to phrase it as neutrally as possible, or I guess not the alignment neutral, but... Um, basically, <laughs> I asked them when it comes to the Pathfinder playtest, the new edition of Pathfinder, what alignments of paladins would you like to see? And then I left it to them to say anything else. I didn't okay. say other than lawful good. Or right, anything. right. So then the the first thing that I that I thought of because I'm the uh, I, I take all the blogs and I post them up on social media. Sure. And so I read everything and I look at it. And this was the first time since we've started the uh, playtest blog that there was actually some thought to saying, hey, uh, we need to make sure that uh, you know we're being nice and we're being open to ideas and all of that sort of thing. 
And the first thing that came to my mind when I read that was if we know going into this, uh, this is going to kick a hornet's nest, why did we decide to, to do what we did if we know it's going to be contentious? Do you know what I mean yeah, by that? No, like if exactly. going into it, we know it's going to upset people and there's going to, it's going to cause an uproar. What, what makes the team decide, well, we're still going to move ahead with this? Mm-hmm. How does that process it's, work? It's, it's actually fairly similar to, to make a reference to the odyssey of when you're sailing through and there's Scylla on one side and Charybdis on the other. <laughs> because just like in our office, among the fan base, there are a lot of really invested vocal fans who want each of the different mutually exclusive things to happen with Paladins. And generally, the people who didn't get what they want are going to make a ruckus, and mm-hmm. they'll be more likely to post. They're more motivated because they want to enact a change. Whereas fewer people are more motivated to post after they're already satisfied. Or maybe they'll come on once and say, yeah, that, this is good, this is what I like, and then they'll right. leave. Unless they're afraid that the other people are going to, they were posting asking for a change, are going to overwhelm or, or get their change, and they're get posting the trying to stop yes. the change. But that's less than the number of people who know that the status quo might not be what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Oh, and for all of you who did not read the blog and missed all, uh, any hullabaloo about the Paladin, yeah. the status quo is that the playtest document for the Paladin includes only the lawful good options for right. the Paladin. So we didn't directly say that. We have not said that yet. We assumed (laughs) that maybe that was already known, so good job. Um, But that seems to be the the big part that's causing some contention. Right. And uh, and so now, and there was a lot of this on the blog as well, but uh, why why that decision? Like, what what prompted that? Well, ultimately, we had these two possibilities, and... They were very close in how many people at Paizo um, were interested in both of them. It may very well have been tied. Okay. <laughs> Seemed like needed a tiebreaker. But there were a lot of good reasons to tiebreak it the way that we did, mm-hmm. even though, as I've actually posted online, I'm pretty interested in seeing other variations of Holy Champion or Unholy Champion or right. different Paladin types to come in. I. I I added the Tyrant Anti-Paladin to Ultimate Intrigue when there was just some extra space in it. Any other class archetype section, I was like, we need a lawful evil <laughs> Anti-Paladin who can be a manipulating schemer and doesn't just go around rawr, destroying everything. I think that'd be more fun. Yeah, but absolutely. But the reasons, as I said, even though I personally feel that way, there are a lot of good reasons to stick with the level good for the playtest. One of the main ones of which is, is honestly playtest space and focus. Okay. Like we already actually literally had to cut a really interesting and exciting possible subsystem from the playtest just because there was no way it was going to fit. The playtest book is already yeah, like as we finished it, significantly above the four hundred pages. And, okay. And we couldn't we couldn't add in a bunch more stuff. Mm-hmm. So if we were going to make paladins of all nine alignments and let's say the Paladin had, I can't remember how many pages it has. It clearly has an even number, so I'm going to say it had <laughs> right. nine pages. Okay. So that it's obvious that it's wrong. And yes. nobody's like, Mark promised it would have nine pages. So imagine if the Paladin had nine pages. And that would mean you get less than one page of stuff that works for your Paladin, no matter which one you play in the playtest. Like, well, you play the Lawful Good Paladin, the Cat Neutral Paladin, there's not going to be very much. Mm-hmm. You probably get like two or three feats or things that are specific to your class, especially since there'd have to be some chassis, there'd be like art, there'd be a lot of other things. So having a lawful good only paladin in the playtest not only allows us to have a very robust suite of options so we can, not, we can balance a bunch of choices for the paladin. We can balance the the righteous ally where you can have a weapon and be more offense focused, you can get the shield and be more defense focused, you can get your steed Mm -hmm. and really start building them out. There's multiple options for each of those three paths. But we wouldn't be able to do that. It would be more like, well, 
there's only three feats for chaotic neutral paladins, and they were really good, so everyone said, well, chaotic neutral paladins are overpowered. Right, right. Or there are only three feats for neutral good paladins, and they were all kind of like, ah, nobody really liked those, and that would be the only feedback we get, which wouldn't be enough to later expand out those different alignment paladins. It, at least we could do it blind, but it's better to do it with a playtest. So mm -hmm. Jason, uh, as the director of game design, and he's posted to this effect, he made the final call, and his final call was, we need to have a robust vision of the Lawful Good Paladin. That's the one we've always had before. That's been the main one in previous editions. We need to get this right because it's really important to a lot of people. Once we do get it right, then that gives us a chassis that makes it a whole lot easier to figure out, so what parts of this are what parts of this aren't right for a chaotic neutral paladin or chaotic good or whatever alignment we decide to do. Right, right. And we know which ones those are. We can take those out, put some new things in, and we're in a better shape. Mm -hmm. Plus, it means that people will have tested the chassis much more rigorously because if we have a thousand play testers who play paladins and there are nine paladins, then we only have like a hundred and some who, you know, a hundred eleven ish who play each one. Okay. So, so essentially, what it all breaks down to is that you blame Jason Bowman. Oh, well, absolutely it's, not. <laughs> uh, okay, but so and, and that actually makes a lot of sense to me. If, if you know, if, if we're looking at let's get the care, let's get the class right, let's figure out how it works, so that everything else can become plug and play at the end of the day um, when it comes time. If we end up, if it yes. ends up getting if, expanded, if if it, if it ends up getting expanded. We're not going to make any promises here about expansion in a later book, okay. or or even we're not going to promise that it's not going to all be in... That was a double negative. <laughs> but we're not going to promise that it's not going to all be in the final book, because we if we make a promise now, mm -hmm. that is selling the playtest short shrift, because it means we can't actually listen to the playtest, because we'd have to either break our promise or right. say... Well, sorry guys, I know you guys figured out that we a really amazing reason why we need to have all of the Paladins in the core book, but mm -hmm. we've already promised that we were going to put it in a book called Listening to Message Boards of Golarian that was coming in three months after, when does after that the book core book. I, I would buy that book. Listening to the Message Boards of Golarian. Listening to the Message Boards Instant of Golarian, yeah, it's a book. What it does is, I think, um, martial characters all got plus 50 to all their attack rolls. And, uh, all right. Spellcasters have a 90% <laughs> spell failure rate and, um, and various other options. Clearly. So, and actually, this brings up an, in an interesting point. <laughs> Clearly, you do spend a lot of time on the message boards whenever something goes up that you've written uh, and you spend time talking to people and answering uh, questions and all of that sort of thing. I think that's important for people to know is that you know the designers are on the message boards, not so much on social media because I get a lot of questions and I try to push them to the message boards whenever I can. But uh, after a blog goes up or when something comes out, the message boards are really a great way to throw some things out there that that possibly the the team can look at. Well, and, I'm on the message boards to. more than I probably should be. That's that's certainly true. Because right. I was a message board reader and poster before being hired at Paizo, and I, I still am. I think all the designers are on social media in some way or some place. Like, I have a Mark Seifter game designer Facebook um, group that I use to mostly talk about game design stuff, which winds up being that I just link everyone to the blogs when they go up or other interesting things that are going on. But right. And I know Jason has one as well, and Logan has has the Twitter handle he talked about last week, and, right, and, and right. so on. But and you're not on Twitter, right? I'm not. Okay, I'm not really on Twitter. If anybody's wondering, that's why I didn't uh, put. If, I mean, if uh, anybody's Twitter Twitter seen name, anything so. I've ever posted, you would understand that it's not going to make <laughs> it in under a character limit. They did. They, <laughs> they expanded the character limit, so you might want to look into it. No, oh, it's, it's not bad. Possible. I'm not possible. I'm shilling for Twitter for apparently. Okay. So. Uh, so uh, well, I haven't done my shilling yet for this <laughs> session, so we'll save no, it. No, we're going to leave later. that. <laughs> um, so now, uh, when it came to the blog that you put up on Monday mm -hmm. for the, the Paladin, um, uh, let, let's just run through that really quick, because okay. earlier you were like, hey, we didn't even say what the thing was. So it's possible that there's somebody that has missed that blog. And sure. Let's kind of run through what's in that blog okay. so people so know. Okay, so we've actually made our way through a lot of it. 
but all not right. all. Okay. Because a lot of it was spent talking about the decision of what alignments the Paladin could be mm -hmm. and posting literally the entire code of conduct from the Paladin. So that's how it started. There were some other um, little fun tidbits that we have in there. For example, um, the fact that the Paladin has some cool powers, which uh, I didn't say directly in the blog, but did say in the commentary. Your, your spell points are based on your charisma modifier. And you start off being able to use lay on hands, single action, to heal yourself, to heal your buddy. Mm -hmm. Gives some AC boost too. So whoever okay. was getting into trouble needed the healing in the middle of the fight. Well, now they're a little bit less likely to get hit or even crit by a boss um, I like that. for a round. Okay. Because it's like, hey, get back on your feet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's lay on hands. And there's some other kind of cool spells that I talked about in the blog, powers really, called litanies. And the litanies are based on ultimate combat litanies, which were some very popular Paladin spells in first edition. Okay. So we've got like Litany of Righteousness, which makes your opponent basically take additional damage from all of your friends' attacks for a round. We've got Litany Against Sloth, which will make it so that your enemy can't take reactions and possibly loses some actions too. Oh, wow. Okay. And they're all one action verbal only spells. The fun one about the litanies against the um, this deadly sins is that if a creature is super slothful, like a sloth sin spawn or a dretch, also known as a sloth demon, mm -hmm. when you do the power that's really good against sloth, they treat their saving throws a one result worse. Oh, really? Okay. And Sloth Demons already have action economy issues because of how lazy they are. So Litany against Sloth is possibly a pretty high-level um, power to get by the time then. You may not fight Sloth Demons a lot, but if you do, those guys are not going to be happy. <laughs> so that one time, I'm ready. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. 50 Sloth Demons. <laughs> and, or no, let, I do not condone 50 Sloth Demons as an encounter for anybody. I... Well, you heard it here first, everybody. There you go. But another thing I talked about in the blog was oaths um, okay. with respect to the code. So oaths are also something from Ultimate Magic in first edition. Mm -hmm. And in the playtest, oaths are a type of feat you can take that actually alter your code. And I didn't talk about exactly how it might alter the code in the blog. I talked about how some of the powers work. So I'm going to be more explicit for the Twitch stream. So it's Twitch stream exclusive. Some OC, some original content. Yeah, right there here. you go. Well, yeah, I mean, Logan gave some extra domains and stuff last week. He really did. He went off yeah, and he gave did. a lot of stuff. All so right. So um, here we go. Okay. I talked about, I think, a Demon Slayer's Oath. I can't remember the exact name for it, but I think that's what the name was. So the way it alters your code is that you uh, basically, and unless it's going, you, you don't have to suicidally do this, but or like divert another more important quest. But otherwise, if there's a demon around, you have to go kill the demon. In the unlikely event of a demon that is actually good aligned or something, like I don't want to spoil an adventure path, but there is one in one of them. Mm -hmm. I don't think that spoils that much. It does say you don't have to kill that demon. Okay. Um, but in exchange, it actually changes the code in a way that might make it easier for you, which is you never consider... I think it's actually a fiend bane oath now that I think about it. It's all about mm -hmm. devils and demons and demons. But you never consider a fiend to be the law, the, to be in a legitimate authority, even if you are like, literally in the city of Dis... in, in hell, where mm -hmm. Dispater clearly is the authority there, just because... That's how much you're against fiends, which helps you not run into issues with like, well, this fiend is a legitimate authority, but I also kind of have to kill him. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, there is a order to the tenets yeah. that would get you out of that because the killing the fiend is last, mm -hmm. but that might not feel satisfying. It's like, well, killing the fiend is last, which means I just have to let this fiend go because he's a legitimate authority. So. That's sort of a little bit of how the oaths work in the code. Mm -hmm. In the power-wise, the way that the oaths work is that they generally give you abilities that help you to perform the oath. Like, it, your retributive strike is really good against demons, if, or fiends, sorry, fiends, if fiends. you have a fiend bane oath. 
And then you can get other feats later that play off your oath, like an aura that stops your enemies from using dimensional magic or like, uh, like teleportation effects like teleporter dimension door to escape like those darn fiends always like to do. <laughs> right. So then we talked about that on the blog. We also got into on the blog a little bit about some of the other features. For example, we mentioned that Hero's Defiance, which is does not even take your reaction. Just any time you are about to go down to zero hit points, mm -hmm. you use Hero's Defiance. It does cost spell points. So you can't just do this all the time. You get a bunch of hit points back. And people in the comments were like, oh, this is just the first level spell, Heroes Defiance from Pathfinder. It's, it is a lot of, it's 19 <laughs> dice of hit point, of extra hit points that you get back. And it's, you don't drop unless the monster also gets through those extra 19 dice of right. hit points with the same attack. And it, since it doesn't even take your reaction, if you have a lot of spell points, like that could happen more than once in a turn if necessary, although how they're getting through those 19 dice, mm -hmm. you must be fighting something pretty strong. And let's see what else. Righteous Ally, but we've already mentioned it in this um, chat a little bit, which mm -hmm. is either your weapon gets your Righteous Ally into it and it basically gains a new property like flaming or something, mm -hmm. similar to Pathfinder First Edition, except you don't have to spend an action to get it for a few minutes. It's just all day. It's just there. And you. But it's better than being permanent because mm -hmm. you actually can pick a different one the next day. It's like, oh, we're fighting a lich. Oh. I'll put my ally in this mace because liches don't like maces, and I'll make it disrupting against undead. Oh, we're fighting frost giants. How about a reach weapon with fire on it to keep them away from me? So you so, can change it on a daily basis. Right. You can put it's in not your bad at all. Yeah. You can put in your shield, make it more durable. It's a more tanky option. You can have your ally in a mount that serves you, and there are plenty of feats to continue along the path, the weapon person can get more different kinds of more powerful runes as options. Mm -hmm. uh, the shield person can eventually, the ally will just raise the shield for you. This is a really high level one. And if it gets destroyed by like a disintegrate or just a really powerful attack coming in against it, it the ally just brings the shield back to the celestial realms and it regenerates and comes back to you and you don't have to worry about losing it, which can be good if you have a that, really expensive shield. Well, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's nice. All right. That's both then, in the same feed. And these are these are higher level That things. one's really pretty high level. And then when it comes time, and I just want to jump in really quick and kind of confirm this, when it comes time for people to play the play, the play test, mm -hmm. um, how are we ensuring that they get to try out some of those higher level? Well, um, I don't know how much we've revealed so far. A about, little bit. We have we have talked Doomsday a little bit Dawn, about, it. But uh, I know, uh, about that. Not so much. Yeah. Uh, okay. But about the idea of how the play test is going to work. And, okay. And all of that. But I do know because mm -hmm. I remember seeing a post. I'm pretty sure I saw James post this, which is okay. the start of a lot of sentences that people get. <laughs> even on the message board, I thought James posted this. Pretty sure the thing. James I, said this. I'm pretty so. sure he did say that it's going to be the play test adventure Doomsday Dawn is more episodic. Mm. It's not like just going straight from the beginning to the end, but in each of those different times, um, and I think Jason said some of this, James said, or rather, we're just going to combine it here. You were testing a different type of variable or thing than we tell the GM, this is what we're testing this time, so you know what we're testing. Okay. And one of the, them, the last one, we're testing some really, really, really high level stuff, although actually even then it, it's probably not high enough level for that particular feat. But, okay. So it's still out of that range yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you also might not be able to get the one that literally grows you angel wings and a halo and angel eyes that can see in the dark constantly at all times. I think that one's a little bit out of your reach it's even for that one. But if you follow good. up on the characters from the play test, right. you probably would get that second feat. You'd be high enough level for that from the XP you got for winning Doomsday Dawn if you wanted to play right. again. Because right. sheesh, Doomsday Dawn has a pretty cool stuff in it. And then cool you can just in it. be an angel. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're not, not, you actually well, do gain the Celestial and Angel traits in addition to your traits at that point, so yes. Okay. Uh, why not? Why not? Um, and then anything else in the blog that we still need to cover? Oh, sheesh. Um, it's possible that there were one or two other things, but mm -hmm. we've hit all the big notes in okay. the blog, and we might want to uh, let, let transition over into some of the questions. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so right now we've got Jim is uh, running the official Paizo uh, account in the chat, and I think he's been saving some of the questions. Excellent. So uh, one, I'm sure he'll he'll like uh, repost some of those for us so we can see those. Um, 
uh, a little bit easier. Oh, here's something. There we go. Well, we still have an option to follow an ideal. The system of assigned alignment to deity sounds like it might move away from that. So paladins are um, generally will will have a, a patron deity of some sort. Although, as people pointed out on the message board, sometimes that's not because you went to a temple and learned from that deity, like the chosen one archetype of paladin from Familiar Folio, which um, in Pathfinder First was the archetype where like a cat comes up to you and says, um, Desna, the goddess of the moon, has given has um, has granted you these special powers, and you you're like, who's Desna? Who's and Desna? Then yeah, yeah. You become a paladin. So I mean, we don't literally have that archetype, but that general right. idea is certainly a possibility, and there could be archetypes down the line that were specifically for paladin. Right. Just because, as Jason announced in a, um, I think it was an interview, okay. but just as because as he announced, um, archetypes often can be made to work for all classes. doesn't mean we're not going to do ones that are for a specific class as yeah. well. Yeah, that's, that's good. And we actually talked about this a little bit last week with Logan, where uh, when it comes to interviews and gameplay and play testing and stuff, it's hard to, to keep track of everything that's gone yeah, out there. I'm pretty sure so it was the I'm, Game Informer I think, interview, though. I think it, had it, was, a lot yeah. of, it had a yeah. lot of information that had never been seen before. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, do you want to do another question? Sure. Uh, are, are we likely to see an extension of the div divinely inspired champion on horseback dealing insane burst? Are we likely to see an extension of the divinely inspired champion on horseback dealing insane burst? Yes. Does that mean, like, does it do a lot of <laughs> burst? Damage? I don't know. Is Night, this referring to like Night Race, uh, a spirited charge lance build in Pathfinder First right. Edition that multiplies the damage by a lot? Lance Paladin. Okay. Um, I would say. Oh, an extension of the la of the Lance Paladin. Yes. All right. Okay. So I would say we are not likely to see another incarnation of a divine champion dealing insane bursts. <laughs> We, we, we like to deal sane amounts of damage in right. general or, or just like amounts that would not be described as insane or broken or anything mm -hmm. like that is, is our goal. Right, right. And I think also, again, you know, everything being pared down for the play test is potentially different from what you will see after the play test is over. Well, even after and the play test is over, we probably still don't want to <laughs> deal an amount of damage that people would say was insane, insane. or broken yeah. or like... <laughs> Right, it's like, oh yeah, we we one shot in <laughs> the Tarask or whatever <laughs> right. with, because this lance did nine hundred and seventy five damage. Like, yeah, we right. probably yeah. don't want that well, like at any time. Yeah, again, <laughs> just like the previous paladin question, some people will, and some people won't. But I probably would know. Yeah, that's not not a good one. Not in a base game, right? Like, yes. if somebody's playing a home game, and they've modded it out a lot. Mm -hmm. Then, at that point. Sure, but some <laughs> yeah. of the mods should be part of how you did the 975 damage. If we built the base game so you can deal 975 damage and you have to mod the game out or else like just it falls apart because the paladin goes and kills everything on the first turn, then we've done something wrong. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, it's a, when is it murder and when is it an attacking evil? So it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a... Um, what do you call that? A, a, a judgment call? No, like a, a definition difference between the two. When it's murder. So when is attacking? There's some people online who are like, well, "Well, we'll have to use a legal definition of murder," and we don't mean to use like a legal in a certain jurisdiction definition of murder. Right. The call is basically, and you know, the word could be changed if if people don't like legal words to slaughter or something else. The basic idea is because the the code says, "Do not commit an evil act." such as mm -hmm. murder, torture, casting an evil spell. So the point where you think it's an evil act for killing them, and that's something you may need to talk with your GM about, right? Right. The point where you did it and it was an evil act, that's the point where it's a problem. But the, the like, for instance, if there's some people in like a bandit camp that are like eating some bread or something like that, 
and your paladin swings in through the window and cuts one of their heads off right away, that could be that could definitely be an issue. So like, okay, so that's bad. That wouldn't be that wouldn't be great. Uh, okay. There's an example. One of the games I ran back. If there's anyone um, from the Boston Lodge here in in Twitch stream, I was running the high level version of one of the interactive specials for Pathfinder Society, and the Aspis Consortium are bringing like a zoo animal, but a very powerful monster as a zoo animal in a cage to try to like sell it for money to get more money for an auction, and. Thankfully, not the paladin who was horrified by this, but just one of the one of the the rogue in the group just went up and started slaughtering these random NPC handlers <laughs> who were like bringing the wagon around. Oh, rogue! The adventure gives you a lot of penalties if you do that. Right. Sorry, guys. Right. Spoilers, but it's it's a pretty old adventure. Yeah. But, well. You know. um, the paladin was pretty upset. If that had been the paladin, this would be an <laughs> issue. Like they were just neutral handlers who were just there to bring the the wagon there. Right. Right. Just wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. I mean, really. Um, and that could be what you see in the bandit fort. Eating bread could just be, like, someone that the bandits have, like, threatened to do some work there. Right. Or, right. or they're an outside contractor. An outside contractor. In or maybe to... they're even a bandit, but the bandits are, are protesting a, a pretty scummy local lord mm -hmm. and not really threatening in a sense. In which case, maybe you were hard to bring them in, but does that mean you just come in through the window and cut their head off? That'll depend. Some GMs might say, yeah, that's a good idea. Well. It, it'll depend on your GM. We'll agree to disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, do we want to... Let's see. Let's see. If there, if there wasn't any alignment... Oh. Did you think about Paladins outside of the alignments uh, as if there wasn't any alignment in E2? Well... Uh, we did make it easier to remove alignment mm -hmm. from uh, from the playtest or from second edition due to a few other rules we put into the game. And some people online are thinking, oh, they put a giant sidebar or like a bunch of text telling you how to remove alignment. We didn't do that, but we built it in such a way to make removing it in a manner similar to, say, the unchained rules for removing alignment, which are system neutral and generally just say, Here's some ways to think about removing alignment. If you wanted to use those in the second edition, it would be much easier than using those unchained rules in first edition was. Um, so in terms of paladins, though, I don't think anybody I asked at the office uh, gave that as their answer of, like, let's have the paladins not be associated with any alignments at all. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I did ask them what alignments they, they were thinking for paladins, but they could have said, well, none, no alignments. The paladins shouldn't be involved with alignments. And I, I, I got a lot of things. Some of the opinions I got were pretty out there, um, <laughs> but th nobody said that. And I'm not saying that that's more out there. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that's interesting that, um, that we, didn't, we didn't hear that very much. Um, and maybe the reason is just sort of what a paladin means to each different person, right? So, mm -hmm. um, Laurie7x3, who asked that, has one conception of a paladin. Jason has a different conception of a paladin. Some of the people on the forums have different conceptions. Like, what is it? Right. And I think for a lot of people, even the people who want to see it open to more alignments, it is a, like, sort of a paragon or, or champion of some sort of position mm -hmm. like it's not just a it's not just someone who smashes things and works for a deity because that that's maybe could be a war priest mm -hmm. or in the play test a cleric with a lot of martial abilities but i think it means something else for a lot of people and that's not to say yeah, that, La that laurie is wrong about um thinking of it in a different way and thinking of the paladin in a way where it might not have alignment just mm -hmm. that it depends on on the way people look at the class. Right, right. Almost uh, so. It's like it's the pinnacle of devotion to that thing, whatever that might be. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting when you really break down this class, which I've you know again, rogue. But it's sort of every, the, you're sort of the opposite of a paladin. I, I kind of am. <laughs> so the, I've spent so much so many more hours this week learning and reading about and dissecting the rogue. I mean the uh, paladin okay. that I. I've learned so much about this, and it's actually a really interesting class. So I think that it's it's kind of fun to to break it down and, and figure all that stuff out. You know. Uh, let's see. What about spells? Do they still do they 
do they still, I'm guessing still, do they still get access to them at level four or do they get the new level zero spells as well? Or are we, now there's also gonna be some things that we're not allowed to talk about. I don't know exactly what those things are. And I, I don't know. I know what those are. Okay. We probably won't run into any of them talking about the Paladin. Okay. okay. But I have a few topics that I didn't want to talk about on Bite Size Forum posts mm -hmm. because of the fact that they need a sort of, they need a stage where they can, it can all be set and you right. just don't hear a sound bite and be like, wait, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll tell you guys about, about Paladin Spells here since we actually have time to talk it out mm -hmm. between the two of us and with, with all of you here on the Twitch stream. Absolutely. Um, it means we won't do the other one if people okay. ask for that. No, that's um, fine, that's so fine. We'll, we'll take, we'll take the People on the message one. board, one of the questions someone asked, a okay. very insightful person on the message board is like, I, they were saying something like, I hope, or they were saying something like, I hope you would fix or how are you gonna change Paladin Spells? There are so many, little things that mess you up as a paladin. You get a reduced caster level in Pathfinder first edition. You start at first caster level at level four. You have so few spell levels. They only go up to four. And your DC is terrible. Um, you're not gonna be able to get offense spells if that's what you wanted or, or like nuking spells. You're mostly just gonna get weird special buffs. And honestly, I, I play a lot of paladins so I guess we're a little different in that, way, in that way, Dan. You're yeah. the rogue, I'm the paladin. Maybe that's why we're a good duo we're a good for this buddy cop, uh, yeah, yeah, buddy like, cop routine. I, I love exactly. it. Exactly. But um, mostly the good spells that were good to cast for paladins were ones that were just blatantly overpowered for their spell level because they knew they were on the paladin list who is not going to get that spell level until later. Right. Right? right. So it'll be like... Yeah, sure, here's this fourth level spell. Clerics of the Glory Domain get it at like level seven or eight or something like that, but you get it now because for you, you get level four spells when, a pal when clerics get level seven spells because right. you're a paladin. Congratulations. So we wanted paladins to be able to get spells mm -hmm. that were as high spell level wise as anybody else, especially since spell level matters a lot in, in the new edition. Like what level your spell is is huge. If you want your spell that's going to remove disease to kick ass on removing diseases, it better be as high of a spell level as you, as you can get to be the most powerful remove disease. Mm -hmm. We wanted paladins to be that powerful. So the way we handle it, actually, uh, we buff up the paladin spells by giving them really badass spells. They're still pal mostly paladin only like they were in, in first edition, right? The Paladin had some that everybody could cast that they were getting. And then these other ones that were secretly better that were Paladin only spells. We just made them powers and you just get a pretty robust spell point pool for a Paladin. Okay. They get some things that cost one spell point that sometimes other classes probably would have had to honestly pay two spell points for an ability that good. Okay. So they have an efficient pool it almost makes the paladins into super spontaneous casters because any spell you got, you can cast with your spell point point. It's always growing when you get new powers. So that lets you, us give you cooler powers right away. So actually they get spells or a power, they get lay on hands at first level, which is a power. And you could possibly oh, wow. get, Okay. that's what starts you with your spell point point. You could possibly get even more than that with feats, although I'm not, committing to there being a first level feat that gives a power right now, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't have it in front of me. There might not be. There is a good one that buffs all your Lay on Hands healing by a lot at first level, I know that. And, I, and gives you, I think it gives you some extra medicine and it's like, I'm the knight who's a hospice knight. But um, the point is, you get it sooner, but you do not cast it in a Vancean manner. Mm -hmm. So like the sound bite of that could have been something like, yeah, Paladins don't get four level spell casting, but with the full explanation, mm -hmm. I think it makes more sense. We see it as a way to actually give the paladins cooler, stronger abilities faster. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, uh, so we have uh, a question from uh, that Jim has reposted for us from uh, the great cow guru. Is, Pi is Paizo willing to change the paladin to NG, neutral good, or give them more features that actually refre reflect their lawful alignment than what we've seen in the to the, the, the playtest blog or Pathfinder first edition? So I don't think there's a big movement towards moving the Paladin to be neutral good at the baseline. 
I'm not sure anyone suggested that when I went around the office. In fact, I'm pretty sure everyone had, as I said, everyone had lawful good as one of their alignments. Right. So that we are pretty unlikely to do. But this question digs into a commentary that some people have had even since first edition of the Paladin, where they're like, uh, they're a little upset that the Paladin puts good above law for the most part it does. Like it smites mm -hmm. evil, it doesn't smite chaos. It, right. Um, a lot of the code, well, a few tenets, like acting with honor, maybe maybe that's lawful, maybe a chaotic, well, wait, you're our chaotic rogue, so would you say that it's, it strikes you as something lawful of like, oh yeah, you have to act honorably and not do underhanded tactics, that's something that, that, that would, those stupid lawful people that would do? That would kill me. I, okay, I, I, oh, great, great, so no. that's a lawful one, <laughs> and respecting the authority figures, that sounds like something you wouldn't want to do. I take it or leave it, depends, you know. Okay, so yeah. those are probably the lawful ones. Right, right. So, but here's how you can play a bit more of a lawful paladin. And even in first edition, there was a sense that the paladins of the lawful neutral deities were a little bit more lawful because their deity was like not even good aligned. They were just the good version of those. So the deity's anathema is actually an important part mm -hmm. of the paladin's code. And um, some people ask, where does the anathema go on the tenant list? So. I'm putting it in a Rana to put the anathema directly in the first tenet with not doing an evil act. Oh, okay. So that we know when your anathema conflicts with something else, what does it mean? It's right there. So since Abadar probably has some really lawful anathema, that can actually stick you with some lawful stuff right at the top that can stop you from having to do some of the good things that are deeper below. So whereas a Shellen Paladin, and we had a lot of Shellen examples mm -hmm. that might make the Paladin overall look more neutral good because she is neutral good, and her tenets right. are all about good. And an Iumidane Paladin, somewhere in the middle. Um, they, she has particular tenets as well. So, so that is sort of a way to, just if you decide that you want a little bit more law in, in your Paladin, then you might be someone who's worshiping a deity that's more right. lawful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, interesting, I like that. Um, Let's see, uh, where are we at? Uh, so we did that one, we did that one. Mm -hmm. Bringing back Asmodean. Uh, let's... Paladins. Yeah, let's not talk about that. We won't. I don't think James would be pleased. I don't think he would. Um, there's the, will there be the option for a holy mount? Yes, that is one of the three righteous allies. Oh yeah, I missed that one. Yeah, yeah. okay. It absolutely is, and like, at very high levels, your mount can grow giant wings too, and you can fly around on wow. your on your flying Peg Pegasus, yeah. Yeah. alicorn, unicorn thing. All right, I like that. Um, let's see, where do oaths and anathema fit into a paladin's code hierarchy? Do we? Well, we, we sort of we answered sort of touched one, on it. but not the other. So okay. anathema didn't say where it fit in mm -hmm. the code, and I'm going to get that changed to say that it's at the top, right? right. Because the top is about things not to do, which was evil acts, and now it will be don't do evil acts or anathema. Right. Oaths generally fit their new tenets at the bottom, but that's not a rule about oaths. That's just what the current oaths do, and they sometimes alter the other tenets. Um, typically, deities might also have a few things they ask you to do as well that are not part of their anathema, and those always go in at the bottom. So, for instance, Shellen asks you to perfect an art, but if the king says, no one may perfect an art, or you promise not to perfect an art, or innocents are dying and you're trying to finish your painting, you, <laughs> you always prioritize those other ones over, over your art. All right, all right, well, I guess that's fair. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, okay, so um, and when, it, when it comes to the, uh, the anathema and the oaths and all of that stuff, uh, the errata should move all that stuff up top. Like, so that it's more noticeable. The anathema yeah. go up top. The oaths, yeah. oaths no. no. Usually they're, but they tell you where they go. Okay. Like the oath of Fiend's Bane oath, off, off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. is it something like, add another tenet below the other tenets before that says, yada yada, kill the fiends when it's not suicidal to attack them, and you're, this doesn't force you to distract yourself from another more important mission. Right. Or whatever it says. That is like telling you to add a tenet and to add it 
after the other tenants. So the oaths tell you. The anathemas is just a legit errata that it probably needs to tell you where it goes. Okay. All right. Uh, Mark of the Dragon is asking where there'll still be a separation between prepared and spontaneous casters. And then uh, it gets into a druid question. Um, well, um, there is a separation between prepared and spontaneous casters. And we'll talk about the druid. Much later. <laughs> yeah, much, see, much later. We start getting into the some things where it's like, oh, it's a good question, but we'll mm -hmm. talk about that later. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, getting back to the, um, oh, is Smite Evil still present? Any details? Okay. So, uh, so that's the other one. And it looks <laughs> like you guys as a chat prioritized the question about spells. Yes. So, there is definitely a bunch of very smiting related stuff that you were doing um, as a paladin, but it's more complicated than just is smite evil still present because it doesn't look exactly the same as the other smite evil and I don't want, uh, actually how much time do we have? So uh, let's see, right now we're probably creeping up on about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to start to wrap it up. Yeah, I don't think that this is a good time to start that. So. But we've got plenty of time later on other shows, of course, you're right down the hall. Yep. I'll have you back in at some point. Um, so let's, because there, there is one thing that we really want to want to get to before the show's over. I said I was going to shill, and I and didn't I don't, shill. I don't blame you. I actually shilled <laughs> on uh, the social media platforms That's today. That's true. Um, so uh, really quick, I'm going to still look through here a little bit. But Mark is an important message for everybody uh, about something that just came up today is when we first started talking about it. So Mark... So, Dan, our rogue, has shilled about our social media <laughs> and, and getting the word out there. But I, I, I guess as the paladin of the, of the conversation, <laughs> I'm going to shill about charity. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, the, the Gauntlet is a tournament that Paizo won the first year it ever happened. And I was there. They, and you get power-ups based on how much um, your team gets in donations to charity. And that very first year, the way one of the ways Jason got a lot of a lot of donations, but by offering an incentive, he said, um, "I'll let Stephen beat me in the face with the gauntlet if we if we <laughs> yeah, win, that's right. and if we get this much money, which we got instantly." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, un unfortunately, <laughs> he was pretty reluctant to actually let Stephen do it, even after he had promised it. So we've never offered that one again. It, yeah, it was great. our most popular. We had a kind of cool idea as a team, which is. We're going to create a gauntlet incentive blog that is going to go back to four of the classes that we've revealed some things about, mm -hmm. and it's going to reveal more. Like, there's a lot to be said about the fighter that was not in that fighter blog. Mm -hmm. Even some things that I was, I was thinking, wow, I thought that would be in the fighter blog, about how fighters can sort of make combo attacks throughout their turn. So we've got the fighter. Uh, which who, each of the four classes is represented by one of the four players on the gauntlet team. Okay, I got you. So if, if, <laughs> if Luis, who is one of our four gauntlet players, gets to $500, we will include fighter information in this blog. It's going to be one blog, but it may have more or less information. Mm -hmm. I get to $500, Paladin information on the blog. All right. If Katina gets to $500, Rogue information. And if Andrew gets to 500, then we get some cleric information. Furthermore, if the team gets to 3,000 overall, unless you think, oh no, I donated over 500 to someone, the team gets to 3,000 overall as a team, we will have a secret extra mystery thing that we also add in to that blog that will help you in the future if you too want to punch Jason with the gauntlet <laughs> in Pathfinder playtest. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how it, so I I mean that's that's a hell of a pitch, Mark. But how we would, didn't give them a link or anything. I so. know. How would somebody uh, give to uh, this amazing Mox Boarding House the Gauntlet Tournament? Where would they go for that? Well, I don't have the exact website written down, which I probably should have it, done because it's like a really complicated hyperlink <laughs> that's like it slash is. team slash 
Paizo or it is. something like that. Uh, but it, it is on our, I did put it up on Twitter and Facebook okay. today. So, so you Jim, can check our Twitter or Facebook. Jim can go through Twitter really quick. Jim like might be able to fast find it lightning fast. Find that link and then post it up. And, and there it is. Look, Jim's amazing. Whoa, Bam. that was Made faster than I expected. Uh, on our end, that was instantaneous. Yeah, so, we didn't uh, even we didn't even see any, um, any live. So please, if you want to. Uh, the, the individual people are at the bottom of that page, by the way, because you don't donate directly to the team. You donate to one of the people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, essentially what you want to do is pick one of the members of the Paizo team that you want to uh, get more information on and give to that person. I mean, that's essentially it. Right. So there you go. And someone here says it's like Pathfinder DLC additional info for money. I want to. I actually want to speak to that because <laughs> I, re I really don't like shilling that much, but I, mean, I was, when I worked with the team to like think of what we were going to give, I wanted to make sure it wasn't like, hey, we're going to give like an extra class or some mm -hmm. other thing right. that we obviously were really going to give in the future anyway, or that right. like we would then say, ha, ah, now you don't get to see it. It is just bonus additional content that until the gauntlet came up and we were like, what are we going to do, that we just weren't going to ever reveal until the book came out in August. So right, right. this is just on top of other things we're making, we're going to make time and words to write down more than we would have done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Rather than be like, ha ha ha, we were always <laughs> planning on holding we, back these things. We had it in our like, back pocket. Because people sometimes say about DLCs, like, well, they, did, they made this extra stuff and then they right. cut it out or whatever. And that's not what we did. Right, right. And, you know, and also uh, I used to work for Card Kingdom. And uh, I was there for that first uh, gauntlet tournament, and it was a lot of fun. And, it, and you know, the the folks at Mox Boarding House and Card Kingdom, they work really hard to get that thing going, and uh, it's a good time. I'm relatively sure that they're going to be streaming on their Twitch. They are. They uh, said they were going to be on the front page of Twitch. Well, there you go. So it'll be uh, Saturday, May twentieth, is when everything kicks off. So or is um, it? Wait, is it Saturday is it? or Sunday? Maybe it's Sunday, May, whatever, May 20th. I'm whatever, pretty sure it's the 20th. Yeah, whatever is May whatever 20th. Whatever that is, go <laughs> the 20th, not the Saturday or Sunday thing. So, I don't know. Um, let's see. So, uh, so yeah, if you can, it's Sunday. Thank you very much. Very good. See, I um, was right. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Paladins are always right, but also humble. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, really quick, there was one. There was one thing uh, that that stood out. Uh, um, let's see. How how does detect evil work now? Um, oh yeah, that's actually a really good question to end with. I'm happy to okay. answer that. I think that's a good one. So we were looking at detect evil, and generally, some of the detect alignments in general are part of the reason why it's hard to remove alignment from the game. So first of all. Um, the detect alignment spells are not quite as absolute and um, precise as they were before. And some people asked online, because I think someone other than me said that about the detect alignment spells, it might have been Logan. Someone asked online, is like, but does that mean that like I could adventure with a paladin and be secretly evil? And if the paladin was careful, or somebody in the party who had detect alignment was careful about casting that spell in controlled circumstances or whatever, they probably could figure it out. Okay. What the paladin gets, we wanted it to be simultaneously less of a gotcha, oh, you forgot to use detect evil, but also less of a problem in, in that regard. So what we did with that, because people were asking, well, what if you did a smite and it wasn't evil and you wasted your smite? You would use right. Detect Evil. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I've played a lot of high-level Paladins, and I didn't want to spend my move action to check whether they were evil or not. I just assumed they were, just and other than this one really weird Alfred Hitchcock psycho reference villain that you all know who it is in <laughs> Pathfinder Society who's not evil and totally should be, other than that, they're, they're usually pretty evil if they look like they're evil because I want a full attack, and it mm -hmm. took my move action. So it's called, I think, Sense Evil or something like that. It's a feat, it com so not all paladins have it. You can choose it if you want it. Mm -hmm. Comes in at a level where people actually might have an evil aura, because if you remember from Pathfinder first, for first through fifth level, most people don't have an aura of their alignment. So it comes in at a higher level, so it'll start being actually useful, and it's less of a, hi, Lord Evilor is the evil one, he is the murderer, now it's <laughs> over, smite and kill him, and it's more of like, Something feels off in my bones. There's evil afoot here. We need to look at these clues more carefully. It's a it's sort of an evil yeah. sense. It comes in from your deity. It sort of fits it's in like a little spider sense. 
Yeah, it fits in a little bit I more like with it. how we talked about um, a little bit earlier when you guys were here for the spells. Uh, clearly, you were here for the spells chat with with with, with Dan, right? And we yeah. talked about how divine magic is more about intuition mm -hmm. um, and less about like rational um, like theorizing and more. So it's more of an intuition. You get an inkling. So that way, you don't get screwed when the GM's like, well, you didn't say you used Detect Evil, so you didn't find out about it. You might find out about it while, like, you might wake up when you're sleeping, potentially. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more of a vague ability, but it's like, friends, a demonic presence approaches or something like that. So that's sort of how it works. Okay. And I think it's an improvement from both the player perspective of not getting screwed over um, as often, and also, n not to talk too much about Smite Evil since we said we weren't, but... We don't want you to like use up a daily use ability by accident and have it not and have it go away. So that will, whatever uh, is the case with Smite, that will not happen either. Okay. So. All right. Um, and let's take one more that I'm seeing okay, here. Okay. One uh, more. I'm seeing. You got uh, it. Evil spells are forbidden. Why are some spells considered evil? All right. Well, generally, uh, there were some weird ones, like especially like in 3.5, Pathfinder removed some of these. There was like. Death Watch, the spell to find out if your buddies were hurt mm -hmm. and it was evil. It's like, well, a good person might want to do this. Why is this evil? <laughs> yeah. So Pathfinder removed some of those. In, in the playtest, we've removed more of those. So we, at this point, a spell is evil because you're channeling dark forces into you. Like, to give okay. the most famous and popular, for some reason, Paladin Dilemma spell that people like to claim is, like, there's someone dying in the road, and for some reason the Paladin has a wand of a, a, a wand of infernal healing, and it's the only way they can possibly save them, <laughs> which is weird anyway, because right. you could use, like, a heal check in Pathfinder 1. <laughs> right. It's like, but they have to let him die? So if we, if we ignore the fact that there are a lot of other ways that you could handle that situation, like... Infernal Healing is the spell people talk about a lot. Like, what does that spell do? If you read the description, uh, it's a spell that heals people back one hit point per round for ten rounds, mm -hmm. making it more monetarily money efficient than casting Cure Light Wounds. Um, Time-wise, it's really a waste of your time uh, if you are on a tight timetable. Right. And it takes a full round to cast it, so that person in the middle of the road may be dead before, it's, <laughs> before you cast Infernal Healing. But right. people like to save their money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I think they fall into Asmodeus' trap because the spell description, <laughs> it, it, it squirts out into their bloodstream either unholy water or devil blood. Furthermore, beyond that, the wands in particular, which for some reason are always in the example because paladins can't get their deities to give them the spell normally because mm -hmm. it's evil. Right. So the wands cost 750 GP, which means it couldn't be that they're using the unholy water, which costs 25 gold pieces per dose. So they're definitely it's using definitely devil blood. Devil blood, of it course. Definitely yeah. is. So <laughs> if you've watched any television show, movie, or anything that's about someone getting infused with a demon, it happens a surprising amount on <laughs> fantasy shows where you have to get infused with the demon's blood to survive. Like I don't know, I've seen it at least three times. I think it is never a good <laughs> idea, <laughs> right? No, it's never a good idea. It's I probably agree. better to let. The, <laughs> even the rogue says this, and he's he's the first person to Come fall on. to a corruption from all of horror adventures. And that is true. That's <laughs> that very is a true, true fact. Before the book even came out, and it, this is just the way you get like a demon bound corruption, like from horror adventures, yeah. is someone squirting lots of devil blood. In, or sorry, not demon bound. It would be an infernal bound. Right. One, but squirting devil blood into your bloodstream. So. We try not going to try and not to make spells say that they're evil unless like they're pretty evil. It's pretty obvious <laughs> that that's what's happening. Um, all right, uh, Cypher, do you have anything else you'd like to? Uh, well, I'll answer one last question. Hey, all right. Raxa Liquid says, "Which corruption?" The answer is Shadowbound. Shadowbound. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, is there? Oh, talking about backgrounds, we just yeah, the blog today is about yeah, backgrounds. Yeah, it is. It's it a is. really good blog. It's too. a great blog. Uh, it actually wasn't. Steven? Even, yeah, it wasn't mm -hmm. even contentious at the point where I left for this. That's <laughs> shocking. People like they like the mix of the fact that it was simple enough to design your own yeah. while giving you some cool stuff, but not overwhelming you. Mm -hmm. It is. Oh, that's great. Cool. I'm pretty happy with that. But there, I don't think there is specifically one called Shepherd or Midwife. But mm -hmm. as people in the thread who asked about Shepherd or Midwife pointed out, be easy enough to. To make yeah, one that yeah. we could just say like, "Hey, you get um, shepherding lore or something about like pasture lore or, or animal uh, uh, an animal lore plus 
a shepherd probably needs maybe wisdom or constitution for the stats to not fall asleep like little boy blue and <laughs> um, right. and then maybe some kind of skill feat but I'm not going to reveal a new skill feat and the midwife would probably be lore midwifery and mm -hmm. going to be maybe wisdom maybe and healing a little bit of because there's a little bit of medical in there maybe so so wisdom was the stat oh, wisdom for, yeah the stat right. for medicine it, yeah. might, it, it almost certainly has a medicine based skill feat okay because hey, if you just need like me you to said, help out with the team there stuff, you go you got it and then and then and over. then the other stat maybe dexterity for the stuff you have to oh, do yeah. as a midwife yeah. maybe i get that yeah so there you have it you have it from the twitch stream that makes sense. just run the those versions of it and <laughs> pick the skill feat a little bit better than we did here <laughs> is there a is there is there a thought of having a custom background uh, option? Well, I mean, even in, in Adventures, in Doomsday Dawn, mm -hmm. and we said this in the blog, it just comes with a bunch of new backgrounds that are right. for that adventure specifically. Story and specific or... It, it's a lot know. like the campaign traits, mm -hmm. where because certain times in a situation like, um, I guess we know that Doomsday Dawn is about the whole... Um, I mean, we've, we've said it's about the, the countdown clocks, right? Have we? I'm okay. pretty sure. Okay. So I, I, I don't know. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. So like, the, the, one of the backgrounds had this like really super specific lore. That's like, when will that ever come? And sure enough, in the adventure, because it was the adventure. Right, it's like, oh my right. gosh, Stephen had to roll this check, and it, in when our playtest version, the DC was even really really high, and he natural twenty did, and he found out like some really weird stuff with his lore about weird dark creatures <laughs> from beyond Golarian. So. Right. Right. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, because, and there's there's more news coming. There's a lot of, there's a big schedule that we've had set out, you know, and things like, you know, monsters coming next week and stuff like that. So yep. there's a lot of stuff that, that is still coming and more news and more to add on to stuff we've already kind of talked about, but not really explicitly. And then other stuff can come out and then we can jump back into that and talk about it a lot more. So, right. um, so uh, yeah, anything else, Paul? I think that does it, so. Uh, all right, and then also, really quick, uh, again, there's a link in the chat that Jim put up there. If you can, go to the Mox, uh, the Mox Boarding House uh, event page where uh, the Team Paizo donation page is. Feel free to give what you can, it all helps, and then tune in Sunday, May 20th, for the event that's going to be on uh, Mox Boarding House or Card Kingdom, one of theirs, uh, Twitch feed and uh, follow along with that. And then the other thing too is uh, in a couple weeks, we've got PaizoCon coming. And a yep. lot of this stuff that's being asked in the chat and a lot of stuff that we're maybe missing or whatever, you can ask us in person because we're all gonna be there. We're all gonna be at PaizoCon. Uh, you'll be able to see me not wearing my suit and tie, which is that's weird, right. but I have to do it. I'll be wearing my, my Paizo polo. Do you still uh, get to wear it with shorts? If I don't mention it, <laughs> oh, they don't mention it, but wah, I don't wah. think I'm supposed to. So <laughs> we'll right. see. We'll see. And you can test out <laughs> the classes we will have previewed up to that point because, yeah. like the like just like the Starfinder team did, because mm -hmm. they totally did this and we totally stole the idea. Mm -hmm. It was a good idea. We're previewing all the classes that will have pre-generated characters at PaizoCon right before PaizoCon. So if you want to play the Paladin, any of the other classes we've already done, or you can guess what the, what the sixth one might be, then you can play them all at PaizoCon. If Con. you're following along at home. Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, this has been a good show. I feel like we uh, walked into uh, what could have been a firing squad. We weren't sure, but it's just been fun. I was going to bring a shield, so. but we couldn't find the shield. <laughs> no, we couldn't. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, we will uh, see you at PaizoCon in a couple weeks, uh, and I will hand out copious amounts of official high fives to people. Uh, Mark will probably be running some games and delves and things like that. So many um, games and delves. It's going to be a nuts. Um, and so, uh, yeah, for uh, for Paizo, for Mark Seifter, and for myself, Dan Tharp, thank you so much for joining us. Have a week. Yeah. <laughs>